strip, I'm nothing on my own. Make mistakes, I often slip, just come in flesh and bone. But I'll prove someday just why I say I'm of a special kind. Daniel chapter number one, book of Daniel, chapter number one. In the evening service, uh, I want to encourage you to be back. As always, in the evening service, we'll not be in Daniel chapter number one. Tonight, uh, we'll be looking at, uh, and this is not necessarily the title, but it will be the subject matter, the thing everyone is looking for and how to find it. Everyone is looking for this thing, and I want to show you how to find it tonight. Everyone, including the lost, are looking for this one thing. It's in the Word of God. Everyone looks for it, and how do we find it? And uh, it is very, you know, the Lord has got a way of, uh, of directing, uh, you know, the, the, the pastor's sermon. He, he, at least he ought to have the only way of directing the pastor's sermon. And uh, you get it through preaching, you get it through listening. I've got sermons listening to Brother Mark in Sunday school. I get direction through that. And, uh, you know, various things where the Holy Spirit speaks to my heart and sort of steers me in a certain direction. This week, this verse has come over and over and over in my mind. As I was sick, this verse was a verse I was thinking about. And it had nothing to do with my illness, by the way. Uh, you say, is everybody looking for the flu? Yes, that's what I'm preach about. The thing everybody is looking for and no one can seem to find, the flu. Uh, no, uh, but uh, this verse just kept rolling over uh, in my mind and I was just sort of stuck there. And, 
And, uh, and so I began to look at it uh, and study it. And, uh, and if the Lord wa- and, and by the way, uh, I'm not going to tell you I have it all figured out, uh, but uh, I definitely uh, am excited about looking at it. And we'll have to take some steps to get to the scripture. But what that's going to do uh, is it's going to lead us then, literally, and this was the Lord. I didn't even realize this until I was studying the passage. Going to lead us right into uh, some, some talk about money. And uh, we're not going to talk about money tonight, uh, or in, but probably be in the next couple of weeks, into the month of April, or into the month of March, I'm sorry. But uh, we'll be talking about uh, money and things like that. And it's all comprised uh, in this one chapter of the Bible. But the one thing that everyone is looking for, and how do we get it uh, according to the Word of God? And so be here tonight, 6 o'clock. All right, Daniel chapter 1, stand with me as we look at this passage. And uh, we're going to do our dead level best to uh, sort of try to wrap this thought up here, at least this thought which we started several weeks ago. And uh, let me say it's good to have brother and sister Heim back with us. Amen. Uh, we have definitely missed them. And, uh, and what a blessing to have them in the services this morning back from uh, Guatemala. They got a wonderful welcome home as it was about 11 below zero. And, uh, and they got some snow even out of the deal. And so God does answer prayer. I say that in love. Not their prayer, I'm sure, but he heard the pastor's prayer. Lord, dump it all in their yard. All eight weeks worth, put it in their yard. And uh, no, I'm glad to have them back. And I don't know, uh, the rest of you, I'm sure, missed them. Preacher definitely missed them. And I love them and appreciate them. And, uh, and uh, good to have them back, not only back in church, but back in the work. And uh, they've wasted no time uh, jumping right back in uh, and getting right back to work, back in their positions and doing things around here. And, uh, but I'm thankful for the work that they were doing while they were gone also. Daniel chapter number 1, please look at verse number 8. The Bible would say, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. Verse 9, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. We're talking about purpose in your heart. Purpose in your heart. Theme for the year. And, uh, and so let's look at purpose uh, in our hearts this morning. And uh, if the Lord allows us, I think we'll get far enough. going to give you, uh, in sort of the closing moments of this sermon, uh, going to give you, Uh, what we have coined in recent days around here as uh, some practical uh, shoe leather Christianity. Some things from this text right here, uh, and yes, we ought to purpose in our heart, but some practical things that each and every one of us, as we look into the Word of God, that we can make a practical application, go out into the world and use it uh, to help us be all that we can be for the cause of Christ. Father, as we come before thy throne this morning, I pray that you would help me to preach the word with, uh, with thy power, with the clarity. Uh, Lord, help me to be, stay true to the text of the word of God. This is your word, perfectly preserved and inspired and infallible this morning, and I get to hold it in my hands, and we've read it. You said your word would not return void, that it would accomplish that in which it was sent forth to do. And so we're begging and asking, beseeching the throne of God this morning that it would do that. It's got to penetrate the heart of stone this morning. I fear that in this room this morning, Father, uh, there is a representation of someone who is trusting in some philosophy or some uh, I don't know what uh, to get them to heaven. Maybe they're struggling even with whether or not there's a heaven in the, or a hell, and they've listened uh, to the scoffers, and they're, uh, Lord, or they're just confused, or they just don't know. May the truth of the Scriptures, which only it can do, penetrate their heart, and they'll come to a saving knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Uh, he is the only entrance into heaven. He is the only one that can forgive sin. And so please do that this morning. And then Christians, there's something here for them. Lord, I pray that they grab hold of the truth of the Scriptures and apply it to their life and so that we can be all that we can be for the cause of Christ. Help us to purpose in our hearts to serve you with a fervency, with a fire, and without fear, Lord, as we face the world in these troublesome times in which we live. Father, please help us. 
uh, and bless now those that are not here due to an illness this morning, whether, whether physical. Lord, many are not here because of physical illness, but I look across the room, many are not, many are not here, and, uh, and it is because of a spiritual illness. Oh, they'll say it's for thus and thus reason, but the problem is spiritual. Convict their hearts at this moment right now, God. I pray you'd not give them a moment's peace. And uh, it'll cause turmoil in their life. Help them to realize that being at the place of God, being in the house of God, around the people of God, around the preaching of the Word of God is the most uh, important thing that they could have done for themselves to start out this week. And so help us. Lord, help me. Uh, I love you this morning. Thank you for this opportunity. We ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Purpose in your heart. The word purpose, uh, just uh, uh, quickly, let me take five minutes. And uh, good to see the young ladies. I prayed while I was praying that you ladies would, when I opened my eyes, that you'd all be here. And the God, God done answered that prayer. I don't know where y'all came from. Did y'all, y'all must have fallen from the sky because you look like angels this morning. <laughs> it's good to see. I, I, you think that you think the preacher doesn't know what's going on, don't you? I'm going to tell you, I know everything that's going on. As I sat over there this morning, I was like, wait. as a matter of fact, I was going to get up and say, uh, Brother Hawk, go find all of those teenage girls, because I don't know where they are, but I know they're in this building, and they're not in this service, and preacher's bothered by that, and, uh, but here they are, and I'm glad, and uh, that was an answer to prayer. But five minutes uh, of a rehearsal, of a, of, a, of a recap, not a rehearsal, but a recap, uh, purpose, that which a person sets before himself as an object to be reached or accomplished, it is a goal uh, with an end or an aim in view which is directed in any plan, measure, or exertion. Purpose always includes an end view. We have to purpose in our hearts. And so we've come to the book of Daniel here. And it is sort of the book, uh, it's sort of the verse that is the key. It is the antithesis, if we could say that, of the book of Daniel. The high point, uh, the key to unlocking the entire life of Daniel, the key to unlocking unlocking the entire uh, book of Daniel is verse number 8. It is because that Daniel purposed in his heart that God would use this great character uh, to really uh, tell us about the day in which you and I are living. As Brother Mark was talking about in Sunday school, we are living in the last days. And uh, and, uh, Russia is only doing exactly what that book said that Russia was going to do. By the way, Russia is going to form an army and is going to go against others. It's Russia Hello, read the Bible. It's in there. Uh, Russia is in prophecy. America is not. So he's right. We ought to be worried this morning because they're fulfilling prophecy, and I'm sad to say, so are we. Brother Jeff, as we disappear as the great world power, as our, was it our vice president, or, or someone high up there has said that uh, uh, they want to trim down our military so we can save some money. You've got to be stuck on stupid to look at the condition of the world and think we ought to trim down our military to save some money while they throw billions of dollars at trying to save a stupid stinking tree or some snail on the other side of the globe. But we're going to trim down the government, trim down or trim down the military. Well, trim down the government. How about how about we have a country that's run by the people? for the people, and we cut the president's pay. Just a thought. I think we ought to add to our military because all the militaries around the world that hate us aren't cutting back, they're adding to. Check China. Well, they're our allies. Uh Yeah, I'm laughing because that's the biggest fallacy and the biggest joke that they have duped America with, and you give them a hot second, and they'll turn their back on us and start sending nukes over here. They aren't for us. They're against us. That's why they're buying us up. The same with Russia. We told Russia not to go into the Ukraine, and Russia laughed and said, Who are you? And what are you going to do about it? You ain't going to do nothing. That's what you're going to do about it, because we're going to cut back on the military, Brother Mark save a couple of dollars so we can save a snail. Good heavens. And I'm all for snails. They're delicious. Anyways, 
So in the days in which we're living, wow, where did that tirade come from? That had nothing to do with God. I think it did. <laughs> uh, he got me thinking about it, and I'm going to hit it again tonight, too, probably. <laughs> uh, but we're thinking about Daniel, thinking about, and uh, listen, listen, you got purpose in your heart to live in these days, though, because he's right. I, don't mean, I didn't say any of that to, to, to scare anybody. My word. Listen, I'm not looking forward to the crumbling of the American economy. I'm not hoping that it comes anytime soon. I'm not saying it is going to come anytime soon. That's not what I'm, I'm not saying that America is going to wash off the scene. We're all going to uh, be taken hot. I'm not saying any of that, and I wouldn't want any of that. I'm not looking forward to any of that. And that stuff uh, does cause just a little bit of trepidation in my heart. That's why I'm arming myself very well for that time, because I'm at least going to put up a fight. <laughs> but you better purpose in your heart in the day in which we live to stand for Christ. And so it takes purpose in your heart. The key to Daniel and God giving him the prophecies that you take in the book of Daniel and you marry them with the book of the Revelation. And I don't understand it all, and I'm not a prophecy major, and that's not really my niche or my thing, but it is in the Word of God, and I understand some of it, and I know what's going to happen and what's not going to happen, and what and that and, and no matter what I do, do know or do not know, I know that God knows, and He's in charge. But it was all because of chapter number 1 and verse number 8, which you have right there. It's because Daniel purposed in his heart a long time ago, and God would use him later on in life. He had a goal, and here's what Daniel's goal was. Uh, Brother Hawk, you moved on me. It messed me up. I keep looking over there, and I don't see you. All I see is my daughter-in-law, and thank the Lord she doesn't look like you. Thank the Lord. But uh, 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 He purposed in his heart early on as a young man that he was going to live for God, and God would use him. Got a purpose in your heart. To be used of God. That's what Daniel does. That's what the key to this is right here. And so we have, uh, we found out that Daniel was a man of character. Daniel's a man of not only character, Daniel was a man of capabilities. He was wise. He was smart. He understood things. He was book smart. He had a lot of head knowledge, had a lot of heart knowledge. Uh, not only was he book smart, I believe that Daniel uh, was also sort of street smart, if I can use that terminology. In other words, uh, Daniel had a good hands-on working knowledge of things. And, uh, and he could get things accomplished. That's why he sort of hand-picked uh, to be a part of this elite group. But he had not only character, not only did he have capability, he had convictions. And so we look at the purpose of his convictions. What were the reasons that he had these? The Word of God, number one. The rarity, we saw the reason, we saw the rarity. Who is there? None other but Daniel. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. It's a rare thing uh, that, that folks will stand uh, in the day in which we live and be counted on. And so we see the purpose. We saw the place of his conviction. Where was it? It's there in your Bible. Look at it. Daniel purposed in his next word is heart. That is the place. The abode was his heart. We looked at his age. Scholars believe Daniel to be between 15 and 17 years old. Uh, at best... 19. I don't think he was 19. Uh, I think he was younger. So he's a teenager. And so we saw his age. We saw the area in which Daniel was living. He's living in Babylon, a very wicked group of people, a very hostile environment, not friendly to the Israelites, not friendly to Daniel's family, not friendly to Daniel's kin, uh, really uh, not a very good area, a place that a culture uh, uh, that had no convictions, that had no character, a culture, it was culture driven. Uh, I mean, they partied and they lived the life and they just wanted what was going to make Babylon feel better. Sounds a lot like America, the new Babylon. So you saw the area. And then uh, we saw the, not only uh, did we see the purpose, uh, and uh, not only did we see all these other things, but uh, we see the particulars of his conviction. What were the particulars? Number one, he had an earnestness about him. The Bible says he would not, would not, would not. He, de he refused to defile himself with the king's meat. The essence, so the earnestness was would not, would not. Uh, the essence was not defile himself. Uh, and then we saw the petition. Uh, in verse number 8, we see the petition. He could not keep silent. I know I'm talking fast, but you were here for all of this. In other words, he's now going to have to make what was private in his life 
And all of us have private convictions. But eventually, private convictions have to become public convictions because people need to know where you stand. No longer is it, well, people really don't, I don't really need to tell anybody where I stand. Uh, they know where I stand. No, we're wondering. No, we're wondering. So you might want to tell somebody because you're, you're giving signs you're dipping the wrong way. I mean, Daniel, just keep your mouth shut. You don't have to really tell anybody that you have convictions. You know, just pretend. I say, this ain't a game. This is real deal here. Real deal. Real deal. There is a courtesy, though, in his petition. Remember we looked at that a couple, three Sunday nights ago? It was a courtesy. It's these two words. He requested. Daniel's not a jerk. Sorry, teenagers. Don't tell your parents that I said jerk in church. And don't come tonight. Don't come to, I mean, I mean, come tonight. But the word I'm going to use tonight, twice, oh boy. Yeah, all of you are going, what is he going to say in church tonight? <laughs> well, you'll be here to find out, won't you now? Daniel wasn't a jerk. In other words, Daniel wasn't belligerent. Christians ought to not be belligerent. My word. All of us have been around the jerk, haven't we? You know, like the guy that we go out to dinner with him after Sunday morning church and he treats the waitress like she's a second-class citizen and then uh, after his $50 meal he leaves her like five bucks. And all of us have sat there, right? You haven't, because you were that person. No, oh, that's right. I hope not. If you are, you're, you can change that. I, I'll tell you, a personal experience, I've been there. You know the first thing that comes to my mind, number one, dude, you're a jerk. And then I leave a nice tip for her on my side of the table so that he knows where it came from. Make sure that she gets paid for her labor. But then I, then, I, then I begin to think this. I bet that's the same way that he tips God, too. Probably throws a buck in the plate and just says, eh, good enough. He hasn't really done that much for me anyways. It is his job. He is God, and I am his child. He really owes it to me. But we've all sort of been around those kind of Christians, haven't we? I, by the way, that's not Christianity. It's called jerkyanity. I don't know what else to call it. That's not Christianity. What did Jesus say? He said, if he asks you, uh, if he asks you for your coat, give him your cloak too. If he asks you to carry his pack one mile, which was legal in that day for a Roman a soldier to have a Jew uh, carry his pack exactly one mile, and they would drop the pack at exactly one mile because they didn't want to carry another mile for the soldier, and the soldier would have to carry it the rest of the way. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, keep carrying it and go the second mile. It's called the second mile, Christian. Then Jesus figured if you'd carry it two miles, you may carry it to the whole de destination for him. You say, he's a Roman soldier. He's probably going to treat that guy different. He's probably going to treat him different after he walked past the mile marker. I'll guarantee you all of a sudden the treatment was going to change because he was going to be thinking, what is going on? The last 25 guys that carried that pack dropped it and told me, pick up your own stinking sack. And now here's this guy carrying it and whistling with a smile on his face and happy to be in the service of the king. See, and so Daniel requested. He had built a relationship with the prince of the eunuchs there, who was probably a prisoner himself. He had built a relationship with him out of kindness, out of friendliness that was not him compromising he still held fast to his convictions and his character. He didn't back down. He didn't back up. But I tell you this morning that Daniel was a man among men, a teenager uh, that didn't have earbuds in or earmuffs on uh, and walking through life in a big stinking daze. I went ahead and said it. Teenagers are up here. They might as well hear it, right? I just heard yesterday. Brother Mark, I just heard this yesterday. By the way, we're coming up with names, by the way, for everything. I heard recently about, oh, I'm going to forget the name of it. It's called, um, oh, my word, something. 
Uh, you know, if you're afraid of snakes, what do they what do they say you have? You got, uh, yeah, like arachnophobia or something. Spiders. Yeah, there you go. I mean, and so it's it's uh it's cyberphobia. You know what that is? Yeah. And then there's another one uh, that I heard recently, uh, uh, and I don't remember what this, uh, this has got one of those things at the end of it because it has to do with, uh, let's see, uh, 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 cyberchondria. Have you heard of that one, Brother Sinan? That's the new one, cyberchondria. People sit at their computers all day long looking up diseases and then think they have them all. Well, yeah. You ever look up a disease on the Internet? Go home and do it this afternoon. You'll have it before tonight's service. I've done it. I mean, oh my word, my side hurts, side pain. You probably have this, this, oh my word. <laughs> Honey, here's my last will and testament. I've written it out after I read the internet because all of a sudden then I realized it said I was going to have head pain and I got a head pain now. And then they said my elbow was going to hurt and I was going to feel three pains right there and I did. And now they're trying to help people with, with this. I, I, kidding me this is this is what our world has become what was I talking about I don't want them to sit here anymore they're causing me to chase a lot of rabbits this morning they have caused me to chase rabbits this morning I was talking about Daniel purposing in his heart having convictions and really trying to do something I was talking about earbuds yeah so now here's the next one People are taking real li computer games, right? Stupid computer games. Or computer game, uh, video games. They can't disattach themselves from video gaming when they go into the real world. And so, like the driving games, I'm, I'm not, I'm, you're going to laugh. This is serious. It was on the news. I was listening to the news while driving just the other day, and I heard this, and I was like, Are you kidding me? So they begin to, they say they can't help it, they begin to drive like they drive on the video game. Run people over, hit cars, do things. You say that doesn't happen. I'm just telling you what I heard. They all of a sudden begin to look at people as like an enemy and they want to shoot people. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh but it's the gun's fault. Yeah, not, we're not going to stop selling video games. Are you kidding me? multi-billion dollar industry that half this room is addicted to? Yeah, I know. I'm in, I'm in your wheelhouse right now, aren't I? It's okay. Buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> Brother Mark asked me if I was going to be able to preach today, and I told him I was going to be nice, and I am being nice this morning. No, I'm telling you, this is crazy. This is crazy. But you know what that's called? This is what I was getting at. Building no relationships. with people. people don't have relationships one with another, do they? How many, all of us, have been walking uh, through a grocery store or, or in some place or, or wherever, I mean, and, and you see these young people, and I mean, they are in a stinky, here's what, here's what they're doing, and God bless them. And you were right when you were talking about driving, Brother Mark. You were right about having to just take a step back and just going, okay, because here's what they do. You're at the grocery store, and here's Junior with his stinking earmuffs on. I wasn't talking about you either, by the way. <laughs> He's got, you know, you got the bit, you know, remember the things that we used to have back in the 80s? And then we went to the earbuds and now they're back. I kept mine and I kept my jean jacket. Yeah! <laughs> and I'm peg-legging my pants again. And everybody in the room that lived in the 80s knows exactly what that is because we were awesome. That's right! <laughs> it's back. All you losers think all that stuff is new? Nope. We had cool way before you guys. The big glasses, 80s, 90s, and it's all back now. But here is, he's got the ear things on, right? And he's listening to whatever awful atrocity that is going through them things that you can usually hear when you walk next to him as blowing his eardrums out, right? Filling them full of the devil's music. And he's walking right down the center of the alleyway, right, where you need to drive. And here's how he's walking. Yeah, or mom is holding them up for him. He's about 18. Mom's standing next to him holding his britches up. He ain't in a hurry. 
He ain't got anything going. Well, yeah, he don't have anything going in his life. Get a job, man. Get a stinking life. But no relationships, see? You, how you doing? Huh, was I like that when I was a teenager? No, because my dad would have backhanded the life out of me. I mean, when I came to church, I called people sir, ma'am, brother, and sister. If I called somebody by their first name, it wouldn't have been the back hand. It would have been the back and the front of the hand at both times. Because that's how we were raised, with a little bit of respect. But you know what we were doing? Here's, you say, preacher, this has nothing to do with the message. It has everything to do with the message. We were building relationships. We were learning how to get along with people so that when we went into the real world, that we could actually function as individuals. Daniel built a relationship with this man through kindness, through conversation. I'm trying to help you young people this morning. And the rest of the young people. And the rest of us in the room. Kindness goes a long ways. And requesting of people some things. Have you ever been in a place and the music is too loud and it just ain't your style of music, which is any kind of music other than piano music for your preacher? So nothing's really my style of music. So if you want to know where I stand on it, I just answered your question. But I'll listen to any kind of piano music, man. I love piano music. I don't care what it is. ZZ Top, man, on the piano. Woo! -woo. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. ZZ Top's greatest hits by piano. <laughs> but, I mean, but you've been in that place and that music is just too loud. And, and I mean, you want to eat a meal, right? I, I, I don't want to listen the, to the top ten. Turn that garbage off. But have you ever had the waitress come over and, and said to the waitress, ma'am, the... Do you, think, do, you, do you think that we could turn that down maybe just a little bit? It, it, it's, it's pretty loud. And, and if you could, that would be really great. I've done it on numerous occasions. And every time, every time, sure, I'll go ask the manager. A couple minutes, the music goes down. No, they don't turn it off. I don't ask them to turn it off. I don't want them to turn it off. I mean, I do, but... I don't need them to turn it off. Hey, I'm only one customer. There's 50 other customers there, and they probably like listening to it. I just don't want to hear it blaring. That's all. I'm only requesting. Uh, I should say, hey, how about you turn? And I've been with people that have been like this. How about you turn that music down? We don't want to listen to that garbage. Uh, oh, yeah, no problem. If, if I was a Christian and another guy talked to me like that, I'd be like, yeah, no problem. Not going to happen, dude. He requested. It's a courtesy. Well, we, we ought to be courteous. We are Christians. Christ was, yes, a man of conviction, and yes, a man of character, and yes, a man who flipped over tables and built a scourge and drove some guys out of the temple, and I don't think he did it whispering at them. I think he did it with a voice like a man would talk to those fellows. Christ was a guy that would stand up and look at that crowd and say, you generation of vipers, you generation of vipers, who doth warn you to flee? I mean, he, that was who. But when it came right down to it, he was a compassionate man that saw people and loved people and talked to people and just spent time with people and people said, no man ever spake like this man. So we are to be like that. That's what Daniel was. He purposed that in his heart, that he was going to be uh, a man uh, of character, a man of courtesy. He was going to be a man of courage. He's a prisoner of war making a special, special request of the most hostile ruler of that day. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse number 1 says, Exhort therefore, first of all, so we see a priority. First of all, this is Paul talking to Timothy. He said, I exhort or I encourage, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Did you hear what he just said to Timothy? He said, first of all, pray for all men and for kings and for those that are in authority so that you and I are able to do what it is that we want to do. Why stir the hornet's nest? Why poke the bear? 
Does that mean then that we shouldn't stand up for what is right and stand up for our rights? You just went on a tirade five minutes ago preaching, Pastor. I know. I'm saying we ought to stand up for our rights. And sometimes our voice does need to be heard. And hey, uh, Christians have been silent far too long and we've let the world just run over us uh, because we don't think that we have a voice and we do have a voice and we need to stand up and we need to say hey you're not going to tell us that because we're following the precepts of the word of God but all way before any of that ever happened guess what we did prayed supplicated and gave thanks to the heavenly father for those individuals because you ain't running a country right now you're having a hard time running your life. You say, well, I, you must really like everything the president does. Never said I liked everything the president does. But I do understand that he is still the leader of the greatest nation on earth. And that's a God-ordained authority and position that was given to him by the people, supposedly, that was given to him by the people. And listen... I ought to pray for him because I cannot imagine the burden that he bears trying to take care of a whole country. Say, well, he doesn't really. D I know. I, I understand how all that works, but I'm telling you, pray for your president. Pray for those that are in authority. Why? Because no matter what laws they enact or don't enact, understand that this king was five times as bad as any of the wickedest king or any of the wickedest president or any of the wickedest ruler uh, on earth today. This was a tirade. This was an evil, wicked man who killed people for sport, who killed people for fun, who would not have been tolerant at all of Christianity and probably would have had all of us rounded up and killed. But yet Daniel has got courage when he requests of the king through the prince of the eunuchs there that he doesn't want to partake of this. It's easy for you and I to say amen in church. I want to tell the young people in the room, listen, don't you let somebody stink and tell you that Christianity is a weak religion because it ain't for the weak. Christianity is for the soldier. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. The Bible said, to, uh, Paul talking to Timothy said, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. This is a man's man's army. And the men and women that are on the front lines doing the fighting in the, in the army of the Lord, don't you criticize them to me. Because this takes, this is, this is the real deal. This is real deal Christianity. And when the rubber meets the road, the rest of them will throw the religion out the window. But a true blue Christian will stand by the principles of the word of God no matter what comes. And they will say we must obey God rather than man. So it's not for the weak. It's not for the waffling this morning. This takes courage and Daniel had courage. Why? Because he purposed in his heart. We see his, so we see his courtesy, his courage, his companions, his convictions gave others courage. And you see them, and I'm not going to read it, but in verse number 7 and in verse number 8 through verse number 12, you would find uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know them uh, in our Bible. And so his companions, what? This is, a, this is a poignant question I want you to answer. What are your convictions telling others? What are your convictions? Listen, hey, hello, what are your convictions telling others? Hey, what are you helping people do? Are you helping people achieve? What are your convictions about music telling others? Somebody say amen. What are your convictions about music telling others? That it's okay to listen to the wrong kind of music because you do? What are your convictions about the Bible telling others that the King James Bible is really not the Word of God? There are other things out there. What are your convictions about soul winning telling others? What are your convictions about dress standards telling others? What are your convictions? I mean, eh, we keep going. What are your convictions about what you put in your body or what you do with your body? 
telling others, well, it's okay to do that as long as you're in love. No. The Bible still says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. The Bible still says it's good for a man not to touch a woman before they are married. Hello. Amen. The Bible still says that. I don't care if you're in love. You ain't in love anyways. You're in lust. We were all young one time. What are your convictions telling others? I'll tell you, there was three guys looking at Daniel, and when he stood for what was right, they said, we'll follow that. I'm sad to say that, Brother Caston, what's happening nowadays is everybody's lowered their convictions and everybody else is following that because they think it's the primrose path to fun in the sun. And it's not. It's not. It doesn't work. What are your convictions telling others? I would submit to you this morning this. If somebody, and I don't care who they are, member, not member, go to this church, don't go to this church, it makes no, never mind to me, I'll say this in love, if they tell you something other than what your Sunday school teacher or what your preacher has told you, they are wrong. say, well, that's a pretty bold statement. You're saying that everything that you say is right? No, but I believe that everything that we teach and hold to be convictions at the Calvary Baptist Church are right, or else I wouldn't teach and or preach them. I would quit my job and find something else to do. And so I just, if I just believe that that is the way that it is, if I just believe that that book that's sitting in that young lady's lap right there, the King James Bible is the Word of God, and somebody comes to her and tells her, you can get another Bible, and it'll be easier for you to understand, you need to tell them, that's not what my preacher said. Thank you for your advice. You can go away now. Amen. You say, well, they come to the church. I don't care. You tell them to come see me. If they tell you, well, you don't really have to be conservative in that area of your life. You don't really have to do this. and You don't really have to do that. You can just lower the bar a little, as Brother Mark says a lot. Lower the bar a little bit. No, we don't lower the bar any. We're trying to raise the bar of standards so we don't lose a generation of young people to the world and the devil because that is exactly what's happening. And so what are we going to do? We're going to make it harder. We're going to raise the bar up a little bit to try to keep them from going down the path that some of us have traveled and we found it wasn't so great. And so we want to help them try to keep from that. And somebody comes alongside us uh, that claims to be like us and then works like a snake, just like Satan in the garden, going around uh, telling somebody something else. Hey, your convictions ought to be lifting people up, not pulling people down. Stay away from that crowd. Because they ain't the right crowd. I want to be around people that are helping me hold my convictions higher. I want to be around preaching and underneath preaching of the Word of God. Listen, most of the preachers that I listen to have, have standards and convictions that are six times what this preacher's is, are. I probably wouldn't make it in their church. And they pastor some large churches that are, I mean, I mean, strong convictions. And I don't mean they're dogmatic and crazy and, and none of that other. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm just talking about men with character and men, men with conviction. Those are my favorite preachers. And I listen to them almost every single week of my life. You want to know why? Because I want to raise. I'm not looking to those men. I want to raise my standard, though. I'm not listening to guys that are dipping their colors very much. I've preached with some guys, some guys that were nationally recognized, some guys that I love, some guys that were being used of God, and they started hanging around the wrong crowd, and now they have completely gone a complete other direction. I don't really listen to them anymore. You say, well, if you ran into them, would you? I don't have any problem with them. We've shared platforms together. I'm just saying, I want to be around those that are helping me to raise the standard, not lower. Three guys were looking at one man, and they were saying, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? And Daniel said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to purpose in my heart that I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat, nor with the king's drink. And they said, if Daniel can do it, we can do it. 
You say, well, a whole lot of them got lost because we have in the Bible that there was more of them there. I know, children, verse number four, in whom was no blemish but well favored. Hey, I know there was a whole lot of them there and only four of them stood, but I'm looking for the four. I'm struggling to find a half a one in today's society because it's always easier to go with the crowd. Most of the crowd's going to hell. You want to get on their bus? Not me. You say, how do you know that most of the crowd's going to hell? Because they're rejecting the gospel. The crowd standing around the cross said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The same crowd that's around today. Oh, throngs of people will go see Son of God because Hollywood made it. I'm sure it'll be a wonderful portrayal of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I wouldn't waste seven cents or seven minutes to stand in line to see a movie that Hollywood has portrayed that has anything to do with that book because I promise you they haven't stayed true to the Word of God. Well, it, 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 it might help some people. It might. I, I Listen. There are a lot of things that can help people. <laughs> the Bible is the main one. I, I, I don't need to, are you criticizing the movie? No, I'm not criticizing the movie. I'm just saying, hey, I'm gonna go see it. I know all about the Son of God. I read about him this morning. <laughs> Yesterday I read about him. I studied him. I, know, I don't know all about him, but I know, I, I, I mean, I know him. I've never seen the Passion of the Christ, never. And I'm proud of it. I know what the passion of my Christ was. It's right there in his book. I know what he suffered. It's right there in his book. I don't, I, I don't need a Hollywood actor to show me what Jesus went through. I, I don't need it. So you see his companions. Well, only three stood, preacher. Mm -hmm. You would be right. Only three stood. But those three are in your Bible. Uh, those three we're reading about 3,000 years later. Hey, not very many, Brother Jeff, have stood in the past generations either. But those that have stood, their books are on my shelf. And when I'm looking for something, or I'm just sitting there and I look over and say, I wonder what he has to say on the subject. I pull down the book. Why? Because they, as we, as we put on the plaque, being dead, yet speaketh. Their voice is still being heard because they had conviction character and they stood for something. Not very many stood but stand and be counted. You say, does that mean if I stand for Christ that thousand years from now people are going to be talking about me? Oh, oh maybe. You're going to do something for the cause of Christ? Maybe. Hey, Billy Sunday was a baseball player, but we don't talk about his baseball playing days. And by the way, he was a good baseball player, a top-level baseball player. Right, Brother Caston? Top level. We don't talk about his baseball playing days, though. We talk about the guy that closed down saloons preached to the entire United States of America at least one time and crisscrossed this United States of America preaching that book right there. One talk about his baseball, though. There's, another, there's, there's more Billy Sundays. There's more D.L. Moody's. There's more great men of God. There's more uh, Jack Hiles represented in this room. There's more uh, Tom Malone's represented in this room. Hey, there's more Charles Lefebvre's represented in this room. Uh, there's more Mark Dalton's represented in this room. Great preacher that went home to be with the Lord just a few weeks ago. There's more of them. Got to stand and be counted. The rest of them guys, they're going to go away and they'll be forgotten about. And somebody will take their ministry and do something different with it, turn it in a new direction, and they'll be forgotten about. They will. All the self-help books, they'll be gone. They will. Because somebody will write something better. And nobody's ever written anything better than that book right there. And it'll stand the test of time. 
So three stood, four stood, we read about those four. Ever had bowed and every eye closed in this room this morning? 